Hi, welcome to Cafe 229. Today, we're very happy and honored to have Dr. Sheldon Solomon. And Dr. Sheldon Solomon is a psychology professor at Skidmore College. Nice campus, nice atmosphere. Hello, Sheldon, how are you? Very well, Peter. Thanks for having me. This is great that you're able to come. We're very happy to have you because you're really well known for your terror management theory. And this theory, I think many people should know about it because one thing I've learned, at least from my uh, Zen teacher, is that we should always have death hang in front of our eyelid at all times. And this is from the ancient Zen master saying. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's uh, <laughs> right on track. Right um, on track. <laughs> yeah, uh, in, from my end of things, uh, Albert Camus, when he said, come to terms with death, okay. thereafter anything is possible. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, that kind of <laughs> sums it up on my end. Awesome, awesome. So, so what, what, what do you think we can learn about death and dying? I mean, I, I'm sure none of us signed up for that. <laughs> no, that's, a, yeah, that's absolutely the case. Uh, right. You know, I remember vividly uh, when I was a child at eight or so, the day that I realized that I was going to die in mm. the aftermath of my grandmother's death. And, mm. You know, I remember being sad that my grandmother was going to die, and then I was like, oh, wow, that means my mom's going to die at right, some point. Right, right. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute, uh, extrapolate over time, that means I'll be tumbling into the abyss. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for me, the work that I do as a psychologist is very much a manifestation of my own longstanding mm -hmm. disinclination to die. Right, right, right. And, and it's interesting because right now we're talking about death and dying and our audience probably be like, why are we talking about this death and dying when most of us are not even thinking about this kind of stuff? Yeah, no, great point. Uh, and that's really the crux of the work that we do and mm. what we call terror management theory. And okay. Terror management theory is in turn uh, based on the work of a cultural anthropologist named Ernest Becker. Yeah. And Becker won a Pulitzer Prize, I think, mm. in 1974 for his book, mm. The Denial of Death. Mm -hmm. And that is basically what he was trying to address. And on the one hand, mm. um, his argument is that, you know, the defining characteristic of the human animal is the fact that we die well but that's true for every living right. thing uh, but we're the only form of life as far as we can tell that mm -hmm. is aware of the inevitability of our demise mm -hmm. um, many many decades before that's likely to happen even in situations where our lives are not in imminent danger mm -hmm. but you make a good point you know when you said uh, you know most people when I bump into them at mm -hmm. first, uh, and I'm like, yeah, uh, we study death, anxiety, conscious uh, and unconscious. Uh -huh. Yeah, most people's first reaction is, well, fine, but that has nothing to do with me. Right. Uh, I rarely think about death. Mm -hmm. uh, right. and, uh, and the Becker point, which may be quite counterintuitive, is that, yeah, that's precisely the point. You rarely <laughs> think about death because right. you're comfortably ensconced uh, in a particular set of psychological conditions that are designed precisely mm -hmm. uh, to keep your mind off the fact that you're going to die. So, right. you know, Becker's like, oh, all right, uh, you know, we're so smart that we realize that we're here. And that's like tremendously uplifting for mm -hmm. me too. It's like, right. it's great to be alive and right. to know it. But then he turns right around and he says, yeah, but if you're smart enough to know that you're here, you know, unless you're a child or an idiot, uh, you're also smart enough to know that you're gonna die someday. Right. You can die at any moment. I mean, this is a beautiful day. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Something can happen. <laughs> yeah, a comet could come out of the sky, a right. disgruntled postal worker could be roaming the campus with an Uzi. Right, uh, right, right. So we know we're gonna die. We know it can happen at any time. We know Becker claims that we're embodied animals. Mm -hmm. uh, and. It's the combination of the awareness of death, 
the perpetual uncertainty. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, to be glib, uh, that we're breathing pieces of defecating meat, not more <laughs> significant or enduring uh, than lizards or potatoes. Right, uh, and right. <laughs> for Becker, if that's the only thing we were thinking about, uh, we wouldn't be able to stand up in the morning. We right. would literally be overwhelmed with existential terror. Right. Uh, right. And what he hypothesizes is that we manage that terror, so that's how we got terror management I, theory, right. uh, by embracing what he calls cultural worldviews, mm -hmm. uh, beliefs about reality that are humanly constructed that uh -huh. we share with people around us. And, and that one of the primary functions of those worldviews is to give us a sense that life has meaning mm -hmm. and, and that we have value. Mm -hmm. And uh, he points out, he's like, well, look at the different cultures in the world. They generally all have an account of the origin of the universe. They mm -hmm. all have prescriptions for how we're supposed to live while we're here. Mm -hmm. And they all have some hope of immortality, uh, right. either literal immortality, mm -hmm. as you know better than I, the, the heavens, the afterlives, the right. reincarnations right, right, right. of all the world's great religions, or symbolic immortality. Mm -hmm. Robert J. Lifton, the psycho-historian, pointed out that a lot of folks don't necessarily believe uh, in um, a, a, an afterlife or anything where you will literally be here forever. Right. And yet they're still profoundly desirous uh, of some assurance that mm -hmm. a vestige of their existence will persist over time nonetheless. So it could be from having kids, mm -hmm. could right. be from <laughs> amassing a great fortune, could be from creating uh, some important work of mm -hmm. art or science. Mm -hmm. uh, and what he goes on to say and what terror management theory also adopts is mm -hmm. that uh, if you are lucky enough or able enough mm -hmm. uh, to adhere to the standards of values that are associated with the role that you inhabit in your culture. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a nurse, my job's to save lives. Right. If I play basketball, I got to get the rubber ball through the hoop. Right. If I'm a banker, <laughs> I'm supposed to make money. Right. Well, then you perceive yourself as a valuable participant mm -hmm. in a meaningful universe. Right. And, and that gives you self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in a proverbial nutshell, mm -hmm. whether we're aware of it or not, he claims, right. uh, our primary motivation at all times is to maintain faith in our culturally constructed beliefs mm -hmm. and confidence in our value or self-regard. Mm -hmm. and, and that the reason that we do that is essentially to mitigate or diminish mm -hmm. existential terror. So my long-winded <laughs> response to your original important question mm -hmm. is why don't most people, myself included, why aren't we thinking about death all the time? Right. Well, it's precisely because of that, that uh, we have the existential fortitude that mm -hmm. results uh, from being embedded in cultural constructions that give us a sense of meaning and value. Right. And I remember Yalom talk about yes. how talking about death and dying is almost, almost like staring at the sun. You can only look at it very quickly and then it will burn you like crazy. No, so, absolutely. And so I, you I, can't really focus on it. Yeah. And he has a fine way uh, of, uh, you know, expressing that notion. Right. Uh, and that's right. The argument would be if you were divested of your cultural worldview, mm -hmm. and that's essentially what happens to people who have PTSD. It's like something so terrible has happened uh. that it literally metaphorically sandblasts away uh, the cultural symbols by which they acquire a sense of meaning and value. Uh -huh. Yeah, and there you are in, in my New Jersey version of Yalom, <laughs> a twitching blob of biological protoplasm, you know, cowering under your chair, groping for a large sedative. Right. Yeah, in the absence of some kind of framework mm -hmm. uh, to view the world, we would be psychologically bereft, yes. Right. So we need this culture and meaning to protect ourselves from this, I guess, anxiety that we really do not 
and cannot face directly at all time. It, yes. it is difficult to, I mean, as, as I get older, I guess I have a better, you know, when we're young, talking yes. about death and dying is cool. That's right. But when you're old, it's, it's real, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, it has gotten uh, more real. Right. And, yeah. and, 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 and once in a while, I guess when I hit the age of middle, I guess they, that's why they call it mid-age crisis, <laughs> right? You're like, wait a second. I'd be like watching a film and I'm like, wait. You know, another 20 years, I may not watch that film again. No, you know? there you and go. Then, and you start to feel that that anxiousness that creep in, and then you have to like keep yourself busy by doing some psychological uh, gymnastic or maneuvering in your head. Yes. Right. Right. And we are all to continue that. I think really fine metaphor. We're all pretty nimble gymnasts, <laughs> uh, and I think that's a nice way of putting it uh, without sounding cynical and right, that right. is that uh, life is an ongoing succession of psychodynamic gymnastics uh, right. to confer a sense of psychological equanimity mm -hmm. and of course the question then becomes so what it, it, is this <laughs> necessarily problematic right or is this the basic psychodynamic underpinnings of the human condition mm -hmm. and how do we make the best of it right so this so what is an important entry point right because yes. we all have to create some kind of value that's right and meaning to uh, make ourselves feel or purposeful meaningful yet protect ourselves from the anxiety but I guess in, in another way of saying that is we all need to make create some psychological defense yes. to make ourselves feel, I guess, special, right? In a way, so we feel we can, I guess, dodge that, immor that mortality problem a little bit. But I guess the key issue here is also that how we deal with this death anxiety, some do it in a way that's more, I guess, I guess, uh, I guess there's a healthier way of doing it, yes. and there maybe there's a less healthier way of doing it. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about how people deal with their death yes. anxiety? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, honestly, the so what is really what's most important here. Right. And most of our work is or has historically in alignment with Becker's interests mm. ha has been devoted to understanding the downside uh, of uh, having, uh, of being death denying creatures. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, the way that we have tended to think about it is to just say that a lot of humankind's most unsavory affectations are the result uh, of mm. unfortunate ways of managing death anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, uh, our original interest um, in the 1980s was to understand why people can't get along with other people who don't share their beliefs. So we were interested right. in, in prejudice and ethnic violence. Uh -huh, right. and, and Becker said, well, it's simple. Um, if, if my beliefs serve mm -hmm. to reduce death anxiety, right. then the mere existence of somebody with different beliefs is threatening. Uh, because if I accept their version of reality, if I think God created the earth in six days, right. uh, and the Borneo and the South Pacific say that the earth was gestated out of a giant coconut, well, if they're right, then I must be wrong. Right. And, and, and Becker then, in a book called Escape from Evil, goes on to say, well, what do we do when we bump into people who are different? Mm -hmm. And he's right. like, well, we denigrate them, we dehumanize them, mm -hmm. we try to coerce them into adopting our beliefs right. and disposing of theirs. And if that doesn't work, we just kill them. <laughs> and our initial studies, uh, and a lot of people are like, wow, that's highly speculative. There's no evidence for right, that. Right. And here's where we come in. We were experimental social psychologists, mm. Jeff Greenberg and Tom Pazinski and I. Yep. And we developed these really quite simple paradigms where we just remind people that they're going to die. 
Mm -hmm. right? Sometimes it's in the lab, write down your thoughts and feelings about uh -huh. your own mortality. Sometimes we do the work outside the lab. We stop people in front of a funeral parlor uh -huh. or, or 100 <laughs> yards to either side. Other times back in the lab, we have people write, read something on a computer, mm. and while they're doing that, we flash the word death so fast that you can't even see it. Okay, okay. You know, uh, 40 or so milliseconds. All right, right well, when we do that, uh, for, for example, Christians reminded that they're gonna die, mm. they like fellow Christians more, and they hate Jewish people. Uh, Germans reminded of their mortality. They sit closer to people who look German. Okay. And, and further away from people who look like immigrants. Mm -hmm. Iranians reminded that they're going to die. They become more supportive of suicide bombers. Mm -hmm. Americans reminded that they're going to die, uh, become more supportive of using chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons uh -huh. uh, against countries that don't threaten us. All right. And so that's one unfortunate manifestation uh, of uh, death anxiety mm -hmm. is that it tends to amplify uh, our hostility and disdain for mm -hmm. people who are different. Right. right. Another thing that Becker wrote about and that we're preoccupied with mm -hmm. is how death anxiety makes people extraordinarily attracted to and supportive of uh, populist and fascist totalitarian leaders. Uh, Max Weber, uh, the German sociologist at mm -hmm. the beginning of the 20th century, he said w in times of historical upheaval, uh, that all of us have a tendency to embrace a certain kind of leader. He's the one that coined the really? term wow. charismatic. Uh -huh. And he's like, these are seemingly larger than life people mm -hmm. that their followers or the leaders themselves believe that they're divinely ordained to rid the world of evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, Becker writes about Hitler and how he came to power uh, at a vulnerable time in German history when he promised to make Germany great again. Right, uh, and right. We started doing studies 20 years ago uh, when immediately after September 11th, mm -hmm. 2001, George W. Bush's popularity went up <laughs> uh, after he said that yeah. we're going to rid the world of evil and he thought God had chosen him. Uh -huh. uh, to lead at that time. Right, uh, right. And so we did a bunch of studies where we found that Americans didn't care for President Bush that much, except if we reminded them of their mortality first. Hmm. Uh, and then they liked him a lot more. How uh, interesting. It is very interesting, uh, interesting. and very unsettling yeah. uh, be, uh, if you're a fan of democracy. Mm -hmm. I fast forward to 2016 mm -hmm. uh, when Donald Trump, I right. call him Orange Hitler, um, <laughs> uh, when uh, he declared that he was going to make America great right. and that he was the only one that could keep us safe. Right. And, and we found the same thing, uh, that uh, our same participants, pattern, the yeah. same pattern, that yeah. Americans liked Hillary Clinton more than Donald Trump in mm -hmm. a benign state of mind, right. but they liked Trump a lot more if they were reminded of death. All right, well, when we remind people of mm -hmm. death, they become uncomfortable with the fact that we're animals. Mm -hmm. And they even become uncomfortable uh, with nature. Mm -hmm. And they're more willing uh, to greedily exploit nature, mm -hmm. even at the expense of non-renewable resources. I will remind people they're going to die and they want to go shopping. And wow. if they smoke cigarettes, mm -hmm. they smoke more. If they drink alcohol, they uh -huh. drink more. We remind people that they're going to die and it amplifies pre-existing psychological conditions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? People afraid of snakes get more afraid. Okay. OCD people, if you remind them of death, they use more soap and water to really? wash their hands. Wow. Socially anxious people hide in the closet mm -hmm. longer. Right, right. And so, you know, our point, and it does sound, uh, you know, kind of glib, uh, but, uh, you know, in one of Becker's books, The Escape from Evil book, he mm -hmm. starts with a quote by Thomas Hardy, the mm -hmm. British novelist, if a way to the better there be, mm -hmm. it comes from taking a close look at the worst. Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty much as bad as it gets, you know, right. that these 
different forms, malignant manifestations of death anxiety, mm -hmm. you know, they turn us into demoralized, hateful, warmongering proto-fascists plundering the planet right, right, in our right. insatiable quest for stuff, uh -huh. you know, in an alcohol twittering Netflix stupor. Jeez. And so that's why Robert J. Lifton said in one of his books that, you know, we may have the ignominious distinction of being the first form of life to be responsible for our own extinction. All right, well, that's, I guess that make us special. That is the downside. <laughs> <laughs> we really want to be special, now we really yeah. become special. No, and that really is the, the, the downside, but of yeah. course then the question becomes, well, is that the only way right. that, that uh, we are able to constructively engage uh, mm -hmm. with these existential concerns? Does right. it have to be that way? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the, the answer, or at least my hopeful answer, is no. Right. Um, let's hope not. Uh, and so the Becker, for example, in The Denial of Death, mm -hmm. uh, talks about uh, Kierkegaard's understanding okay. uh, of um, how is it that we could possibly uh, constructively engage with the reality of our mortality. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, in Kierkegaard's view, if you want to get a good education, then apply to a college or university. If you want to become an authentic human, mm -hmm. he's like, you have to go to the school of anxiety, <laughs> which sounds awfully <laughs> ominous. <laughs> and, and, wow. And, yeah, wow. <laughs> and, and my understanding of Kierkegaard, which is admittedly superficial and secondhand because mm -hmm. it's through reading Becker's account of Kierkegaard, but evidently the logic is, is that, and this gets back to the, the Camus point, come to terms with death, right. thereafter anything is possible. When you look at what happens in our studies, Peter, th these are very fleeting, even unconscious mm -hmm. death reminders. Right, right. And, and that's what makes us respond reflexively mm -hmm. and defensively. Mm -hmm. That's very different than the long-standing traditions in both philosophy mm -hmm. as well as religion, mm. uh, where the hope is, is that we devote a substantial chunk of our lives mm -hmm. um, uh, coming to terms with our mortality, n not in some morbid effort to be a punk rocker right, in a right. goth band, Mm -hmm. uh, but rather to get to the point where uh, we're able to live to the fullest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so in Kierkegaard's view, uh, the way that that happens is uh, you're able to step back and to momentarily recognize the arbitrary and symbolic nature of your cultural surroundings mm -hmm. and of your identity in that context. Uh, after all, you didn't choose to get born in the time and place that right. you are, a and I didn't choose my name. Uh, and so, uh, and you realize that it, it really didn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, I'm Sheldon Solomon, you know, born in Brooklyn, grew up in the Bronx, <laughs> I'm here in the 21st century, a professor at Skidmore. Right. Uh, yeah, but uh, for all I know, I could have been born as a goat herder in Mongolia, you know, in the third century, or even a goat. Uh, your past matter. life. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and so the point, though, is psychodynamically, here I am just for the moment, uh, abandoning uh, my identity and culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and existentially at that particular moment, says Kierkegaard, you know, I am no one and no thing, which mm -hmm. is uh, psychologically quite precarious. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, some people, of course, can tumble into the abyss. Mm -hmm. Some people, are unable to bear that, uh, and uh, the, the big uh, unknown, yeah. yeah, and they just they they take flight in their culturally constructed identities, mm -hmm. the, the, and in his language, uh, they become tranquilized by the trivial, mm -hmm. uh, their incapacity 
to uh, come to terms with the reality mm -hmm. of their mortality mm -hmm. uh, has uh, rendered them culturally constructed meat puppets. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but Kierkegaard believes, and by the way, if we're honest, all of us are this way from right, time right. to we time. We always need that something. Th there you go. So yeah. Sometimes I, I need to be a, a meat puppet uh, right, watching right. TV, spraying cheese whiz on a cracker. Right. But those are the same people that elected Hitler. Those are the same people that are doing nothing about right. the Earth's climate being mm -hmm. destroyed. So meat right. puppets are not harmless, right. uh, even if they're sedate. <laughs> uh, and so Kierkegaard's point is I have to keep going. Mm -hmm. I, I have to accept uh, the fact that I'm going to die, mm -hmm. not as an abstraction, because if you say to people, you're going to die, most people would be like, of, so? <laughs> of, of course I'm going to die. <laughs> right. But, but the, these guys, Kierkegaard, Heidegger, they're like, when you say, of course I'm going to die, generally in the back of your head, you're adding, I'm going to die, not now. <laughs> I'm going to die at some vaguely unspecified mm -hmm. future moment. That's just kicking the psychological can down the road. That's right. not the same as accepting that our death can be immediately impending mm. at, at any particular moment. It could be any time. It could be yeah. any time. Yeah. And then the existentialists, they talk about coming to terms with death and grappling with existential guilt, mm -hmm. which is not a moral transgression, mm -hmm. so much as accepting the responsibility for having to make choices in our lives, mm -hmm. despite the fact that lots of them uh, are circumvented uh, by uh, reality. In mm -hmm. other words, like it or not, I'm not going to give birth to children. Right, you know, right, like right, it or right. not, because I'm a midget, I'm not going to be a center on a professional basketball right, team. Right, right, right. Uh, There's and, some limitations. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the Kierkegaard view is if I can do that, I'm now in a position to essentially be reborn. Mm -hmm. uh, and for Kierkegaard, that's from a leap of faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and Kierkegaard, being devoutly religious, mm -hmm. uh, his feeling was that the only way that you can be reborn as a mature individual is to connect yourself psychologically mm -hmm. to a, a transcendent power, mm -hmm. uh, which for Kierkegaard uh, was the Christian God. Right. right. Uh, and, oh, and, uh, and I think that uh, that's one route mm -hmm. to psychological equanimity right. for some. Now, Heidegger had a slightly different view mm -hmm. derived from Kierkegaard. He was like, I think Kierkegaard is on the right track, mm -hmm. but in his view, and it's a more secular one, right. um, he, he said, well, I don't know if you have to have a leap of faith in God. How about a leap of faith in life itself? Right. Uh, and if I understand Kierkegaard correctly, mm -hmm. what he's arguing is that if you can come to terms uh, with your mortality, if mm -hmm. you can uh, come to terms with existential guilt, mm -hmm. his feeling is that that in its own right is potentially transformative. Mm -hmm. and, and I like Peter how Kierkegaard describes what it's like on the other side of that process. Mm -hmm. and, and I like his language. He says, uh, one phrase he uses is anticipatory resoluteness. Okay. And, and most people are like, I get it. I'm anticipating. Well, that means you're looking forward. Right, That's good. Right. <laughs> and you're looking forward resolutely that you're, you actually want to accomplish things and that you're ardently and admirably devoted mm -hmm. to your life goals. And then he says that, that all, it also engenders solicitous regard for other people and other things. Mm -hmm. And to me, that, that has very much hints uh, of the Eastern views of right. things. Right. Uh, and his argument is that when you care about uh, other things, when you care about other people, mm -hmm. when you are looking forward and when you're devoted to accomplishing mm -hmm. things, um, he, he goes on and he says that 
uh, life feels like uh, you're on this ongoing adventure uh, where you're, you're perfused with unshakable joy. Mm -hmm. And I like that because Heidegger's not a fool. This is not to say uh, that this state of affairs uh, obliterates anxiety or suffering. Right. Uh, what it does is to, quite the contrary, it opens us up uh, to the full range of experiences, uh, you know, that yeah. allows us to be at our best. Uh, and so, so if you, tr I guess what Heidegger is trying to say, once, once we fully become responsible for our death and dying, we're less bound by the illusory nature Absolutely. of this cultural thing that we create. Yes. And, and I guess it's like in order to be free from the matrix, you've got to see the matrix. There you right? go. That's lovely. And, and you know, the, and I'm just getting acquainted with Kierkegaard. Uh, and, you know, I, I was familiar with the terms authentic and inauthentic. Right. But I'm seeing some translations now where authenticity is sometimes translated as own self. Hmm. And, and basically, yeah. What you're doing is you're seeing through the cultural haze. Uh, this is not to say that you abandon your right. cultural identity and withdraw from life. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. it, it's just you're a more active participant because mm -hmm. you enter the stream of life in possession mm -hmm. of who you really are. Right. And I, I love how Kierkegaard, Becker, and Heidegger agree uh, when they say that if we can get to that state, uh, they're like, well, how do we know? And they're like, well, you know, because people who are like that are characterized by humility and, a, and an openness to a multidimensional reality. Mm. Those are Becker's words. But I, I find them quite compelling. Uh, humility, important. And most of us in America don't understand it because we see it uh, as a pejorative um, word that weak, weak self-deprecating. Yeah. yeah. When in fact, humility is the ultimate manifestation uh, of courage and character. Mm -hmm. You know, it is the way that I see it. Uh, the, right. the recognition, uh, the noble. Uh, recognition of uh, the fact that we are genuinely radically inconsequential that you know we're born in a time and place not of our choosing mm -hmm. uh, we're here uh, for a tiny amount of time mm -hmm. uh, in a ginormous universe that's beyond our capacity to understand yeah. uh, and that is you know benignly indifferent to mm -hmm. our fate Right. And that while for some uh, that might be a devastating realization, mm -hmm. uh, I like the folks, uh, and I'm not there yet, <laughs> but I, I like the people in the religious and philosophical traditions who mm -hmm. point out uh, that in a world of genuine humility, mm -hmm. where everything matters, mm -hmm. that does not diminish you one bit right in right, fact right, right. rather it, it, it's one of these this is where the rising psychological tide lifts mm. all boats mm. as it were it, it seems like our normal unconscious defense for death anxiety is to blow ourselves exactly right? to make ourselves as special as yes. big as possible but i think all spiritual tradition are all teaching one thing, which is shrink ourselves. Absolutely. Become smaller and to see the connectedness. I, I, I love that, and I love the way you put that. And it's that, I, I do, I think that um, we're, we're just swimming upstream against an unfortunate tide. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's a bad metaphor, but I, I do think that the, our, our inclination in response to existential anxieties is to try and enlarge ourselves. Right, to be special to in be some special. way. To be special. But like Virginia Woolf put it in a room of one's own, uh, th the way that we typically do that is we enlarge ourselves by diminishing those around us. Right, uh, and by destroying others who want to be special. By destroying others and 
it's an insatiable desire, mm -hmm. you know, because if I'm the best because I'm the richest, well, I'm always going to be looking over my shoulder because somebody <laughs> else is going to be, well, I want more. Right. And any effort to enlarge ourselves, it's a psychological arms race because mm -hmm. there's no point at which you can ever be happy. Mm -hmm. And I think it's safe to be leery of any insatiable desire. Yeah, uh, because yeah. to me, death anxiety is always lurking beneath it. Mm -hmm. But I like how you put it a moment ago, this idea that uh, to make ourselves small is, uh, first of all, it puts things in more accurate perspective. But it also fosters, I believe, the mm -hmm. kind of sense of community and interdependence mm -hmm that is a more accurate reflection of human nature. Mm -hmm. And frankly, if we are going to survive as a species and to prosper, right. the, the only viable direction that we now have at our disposal. You know, Martin Luther King put it pretty well in his letter from Birmingham jail when he mm -hmm. said, the world's getting smaller. Right, I, I right. can't say anymore that something that happens on the other side of the planet has yeah. nothing to do with me. Uh, and so I, I like um, the fact that a lot of attention now uh, in terror management research mm -hmm. is not, well, let's do another study to show that death reminders make mm -hmm. people more stupid right. uh, and, and mean, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, folks are turning it around and they're saying, wow, let's look at what happens uh, when we ask people to be humble. Mm -hmm. And what huh. they're finding is magnificent because if you uh, remind people to be humble mm -hmm. and then you remind them that they're going to die, they don't hate somebody because they're different. Okay. That's awesome. Gratitude is something else that uh, folks have been studying. And I love that because any one of us that had lunch today or slept in a bed last uh -huh. night has something to be grateful for. Sure, sure. And the same thing when, in a, when we bring people into the lab and, we, and when we say, just write something down mm. that you're grateful about, uh -huh. that also eliminates defensive reactions to death reminders thereafter. I see. So, yeah. so it seems like your research is taking a new direction right now. Yeah, I'm kind of sick of death uh, <laughs> because it was never about death. You know, right. uh, you know, back to Abe Lincoln, you know, it's not the years in your life, it's mm -hmm. the life in your years. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we were as young social psychologists trying to figure out uh, why people are assholic, if you'll pardon the expression. Why mm -hmm. are we so mean? Why are we so greedy? Mm -hmm. Why are we so narcissistically at times self-absorbed? Right. And I think that we've answered those questions, mm -hmm. not that there aren't other things that can be done. Right. And yeah, I, for myself and for other like-minded researchers and also other people in other domains that have been more interested mm -hmm. in fostering, uh, you know, personal growth and social progress. Mm -hmm. the, now the question has become, let's think of ways that we can demonstrate mm -hmm. that enable us to manage existential anxieties mm -hmm. in a fashion that brings out the best in us. Mm -hmm. So, so your previous research are focusing on why people making themselves big. Yes. And now you're focusing on how can we become small. Yeah. How can we become small? In uh, some way. In some way. Yeah. So it seems like, uh, can you give us an example of your research? Like right now, is there any research project specifically on how you help people to be more humble, like you ask them to write gratitude letters? Yeah, so actually right now the, um, the project that we're about to start is, uh, it is on gratitude. Okay. Uh, and um, we, um, we're trying, this, this kind of a, a, it's not great methodologically uh, because we're trying to do something that we think is going to be engaging and potent 
but it's probably confounded. We're doing like a 10 minute uh, guided meditation. Oh, wow. A, really? <laughs> about gratitude. Okay. Okay. Because we wanted, we wanted that, we wanted something not writing, not okay, talking. Okay. okay. We wanted something that would ideally be very deeply immersive. <laughs> yeah. And we're comparing that to a, a similar guided imagery exercise where people are asked to reflect on a vacation. Okay, like you a know, nice beach. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> something that should be very pleasant. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But our point is that gratitude, humility, uh -huh. mindfulness, okay. these are much more than pleasant experiences. Okay, that, right, right. That, you know, that, that again, as folks who come from religious and philosophical traditions mm -hmm. are much more poignantly and powerfully aware of this than we mm -hmm. are, that that's the bedrock of psychological fortitude and well-being. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, and we hope to work more in that domain. Mm -hmm. There's other folks, very talented researchers, that um, they're um, in light of recent research with psychedelics. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of folks, you know, not like uh, former hippies like me, you know, <laughs> real doctors uh, in real hospitals. You know, the, they're showing that single doses uh, of, um, what is it, MDMA or psilocybin mm. mushrooms, that terminally ill people become much less anxious or depressed. Mm -hmm. uh, they're finding that it uh, might help uh, reduce death anxiety. Mm -hmm. Might uh, and so here's another direction mm -hmm. uh, that uh, might prove to be quite constructive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it seems like your research is getting even more interesting. Your theory is taking uh, a nice, interesting direction right now. Well, I, I, it interests me. So yeah, <laughs> right. And, and uh, you know, and again, it may maybe sound a little silly, and we haven't done any studies yet. But I'm also preoccupied right now, Peter, with Eric Erickson's huh. um, notions of generativity okay, and okay. legacy. You know, uh -huh. I, I I like where Erickson talks about. Um, you know, as you get to be middle aged, there comes a point where you're <laughs> like, wow, I'm not going to get more, not that much more done. Yeah. And you become more interested in what you're doing uh, that might uh, end up being of value to those who come after us. Mm -hmm. Now, right. this is not about being recognized necessarily. Mm -hmm. Right, right. It's it, not like a, not an immortality it's project. It's not an immortality project. Right. Uh, and, um, and, and again, I, I, this is um, what I've been doing lately um, is I'm planting fruit trees mm -hmm. uh, in my house and I'm going to start planting them here Okay. because uh, it's kind of Johnny Appleseed is <laughs> like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be here that much longer. I hope I've got some time, <laughs> but I'm planting trees in our backyard mm -hmm. because I like fruit. Mm -hmm. And it grows on trees, I now know. I thought it came in plastic in the stores, but <laughs> not. <laughs> but what we, so we got these trees, and I, the, the peach tree for the first time made peaches this year. They're four or five years old. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, I love this idea that in 30 or 40 years, I'm not writing my name on these trees, they're right. just there. <laughs> and I'm finding it very uplifting. I, I don't. I'd like to think it's not just being tranquilized by the trivial. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to think that my sense that this is good and my enthusiasm for this venture and for what it seems to me makes my life mm -hmm. uh, just infused with unshakable joy, like Heidegger puts it. Yeah. Yeah, that part of it is I'm trying to do something not so I'll be remembered, but mm -hmm. that humans here when I'm not mm -hmm. uh, will partake of that mm -hmm. and enjoy it. And, but, and I, I'm wondering if that's not another very productive way of proceeding. Sure, because I, I think what the, the more we look at our life, the more we realize what makes us come from everything that's not us. That's right. Which your tree will, of, of course, will become part of this interconnectedness. Yeah. So in some way, that is a much healthier way of dealing with life. 
live a purposeful, create purposeful uh, existence. You know, this remind me, uh, the, there's a famous Chinese poem talking about death. I mean, it ne they never mentioned a word about death and dying, but they said life is like the, the wild geese who landed on the snow with the footprint on the snow. And that's what life is about, the footprint on the snow. That's so, so lovely. Yeah, that is a famous Chinese poem about death and dying. And that's what, you know, like life is a lot like yes. that. The footprint on the snow, you know. Even though we think we're going to leave the footprint there forever, but it will disappear with the wow. snow. But it's a beautiful, no, nevertheless, no, I, it's still beautiful. I, I, I love that. In fact, one of the most beautiful things one of my students wrote 20 or 30 years ago after reading Becker, and it was something along the lines of, you know, who cares if you're walking on a beach, if you leave footprints in the sand of time. Mm -hmm. It's not about the footprints, it's right. that you were there. And that, yeah. you know, the, that's awesome. You were there. You were there. You were there. That's what matters. Thank you so much. Any final words? What do you think is the take home message for our audience? I, you know, the, the take home message, I think, uh, is that life is great, that the fact that it's of finite duration, while surely discombobulating and grounds for apprehension, is ultimately part of what renders it so distinctly fine. Mm -hmm. And that, moreover, we're not preoccupied with death for its own sake. So one of my favorite authors, a guy named Sherwood Anderson, mm -hmm. an American author, on his tombstone uh, is written, life not death is the great adventure. So that would be my take home message. Life. Life not death, death is the great is adventure. The great adventure. Thank you so much, Sheldon. This Thank is you. a great, great conversation. We're really happy to have you. Thank you for listening to our conversation. I hope you learned a little something about death and dying. And please check out Dr. Solomon's books. He has many books about how we can manage our death better. Of course, I think his new research direction about being humble and gratitude is definitely something we want to follow. Thank you for watching again every month, third Friday. Stay tuned.